This is a space launch vehicle being developed at JP Aerospace. It is the latest configuration of the orbital airship, the Ascender H1 variant. Hey, JP here. What is an orbital airship? Well, an orbital airship is a vehicle that climbs above the atmosphere and then slowly accelerates to orbital velocity. It is the final stage in ATO, the Airship to Orbit Launch System. ATO is a huge program, taking decades of development. It's a good thing we started decades ago. As we develop the engines, work the wind tunnel, and fly the prototypes, the design gets refined. Old configurations adjusted, the vehicle evolves. When there are enough changes, we update the overall configuration, make new drawings and models. These are some of the earlier versions. This is our earliest concept of the Ascender. This one's been modified for flight at high speed at low pressure. And finally, this is the fully realized vehicle. With our real first pass at integrating the engine designs into the overall concept. In the last few years, we've made great progress on the ATO technology set, and it's time to upgrade the configuration once again. The Ascender H1 variant is an airship with an internal volume of 11 million cubic meters. The length along the wing is 1,828 meters. That's over a mile long. The airship has a fabric outer shell with plastic film inner lifting cells. Its internal structure consists of pressurized air beams. It's covered with thin film solar panels that generate 90 megawatts of power. The internal configuration is similar to that of our Ascender 9 research vehicle. The biggest update for the H1 is the airfoil cross-section of the wing. It blends the requirements of providing enough volume for the lifting gas and the hypersonic velocity it needs to reach orbit. Another big change is the plan form. That can be thought of as the shape of the wing from above. We've increased the cord or width of the wing. This was to further reduce the wing loading. That's the amount of weight per square foot of area on the wing. It was also needed to improve lift at altitudes above 300,000 feet. Hybrid chemical electric rocket engines drive the orbital ascender. Not a liquid engine, not a solid, and not an ion engine, but a little bit of all three. Think of it as a linear accelerator that you light on fire. We've conducted over 130 test firings in the engine program so far. This means the engine has also changed over time. And based on our current test data, we can now make a closer projection of the final engine configuration. You know, the whole upshot is we've reduced the number of engines, but have made them larger. The earlier version of the orbital sender used 32 engines in clusters of four, four clusters on each wing. The H1 uses fewer but larger engines, 12 in all, and they're set up in clusters of three, two clusters on each wing. The engines aren't just these little fairings on the side, they extend all the way through the hull to the leading edge of the wing. Notice the glowing line that runs all along the leading edge of the wing. This is the plasma leading edge. It's always been part of the plan, but we've never shown it until now. This is part of the active drag reduction system. It interacts with the leading edge of the hypersonic shock wave. This has been studied for decades and there are countless IAAA and other peer-reviewed journal papers and studies on the process. However, active drag reduction systems have been a bit creatures of the lab. There are not very many examples of them being deployed in the real world. 
getting this tech into the real world is one of the big challenges of this program. Plasma drag reduction is ideally suited for near vacuum hypersonic flow control. But there's not much call for that unless you just happen to have a hypersonic airship flying above 200,000 feet. And then it comes in very handy for dramatically reducing drag. Surprisingly, it doesn't take as much power as you would think. With the big picture configuration coming along this far, we needed to start working on the smaller vehicle details. As part of this, we started working on the configuration of the cargo bays. There are two, one bay on the left wing and one on the right. Originally, we were going to match the space shuttle's cargo bay. A lot of excellent work went into that design and it was unmatched in cargo versatility. However, it does not take advantage of the real strength of the orbital airship, the ability to carry extremely large volumes. We expanded the size from the shuttle bay to a square 30 meters, about 100 feet, on a side and 20 meters deep. This will give the ability to deploy really huge payloads. Payloads like complete space station modules with the external systems already mounted. This reduces in a big way orbital assembly times. Satellites can be carried with the solar panels and antennas already deployed, saving weight, complexity, and reducing operational risk. The gentle climb dynamics of the orbital ascender makes the launch of these fragile configurations possible. A cargo bay is like your seat on an airline. For a passenger, the payload it is the most important thing. You know, most of the time, we don't even know what kind of plane we're on, but we always know if there's not enough leg room. Look at the cargo bay. You notice you don't see any doors. On the ascender, the hull is fabric. The cargo bay doors are fabric as well. The doors roll away like a roll-up door on a warehouse. Being on top, the doors see less dynamic loading on ascent and re-entry. You know, I can't just work with files. It's just me, but I need to see things and hold things in the real world. This big old thing is a model that we made on a 3D printer of the H1. It's bigger than can be printed on the printer in one go, so it's made of seven parts that we printed separately and glued together. It really gives you a feel for the airfoil. We'll add engine fairings, the solar panels, the cargo bay, and the crew transfer docking ports. And we'll probably even give it a coat of paint. This model shows the cross section of the wing. Note, this is not the airfoil in the sense that the relative wind is actually coming down here at a really steep angle, making the functional airfoil quite a bit differently. But what this is, is a cross section of the structure of the wing itself. You know, working out issues on the inflated cross section like this is exactly what our current airship, the Ellipse, is all about. Next on the model front, we are building a one foot wide model of the cargo bay. This will let us start taking a look at the details of payload interaction. We're also taking a deeper dive into the space shuttle cargo bay's operational issues. There is just lots of good data to be mined there. Now for the question everybody asks, when will it fly? You know, the space business is notoriously bad at predicting the future. You know, we always seem to be five years away from that Mars base. You know, I'm no better at forecasting either. So I simply don't play the prediction game. But I can tell you where we are at and what's coming ahead. We've built 10 V airships so far. 
They have ranged from 18 to 175 feet long. Our newest vehicle, the Ellipse, has really changed our thinking about inflated wing cross-section design and taught us so much, and it hasn't even flown yet. We've conducted over 130 engine test firings and conducted countless wind tunnel tests up to Mach 4. It seems like a little thing, but this part is really the key to the whole project. You need to test your ideas in the real world. Our real world is the upper atmosphere, and it's a pretty challenging place to operate in. We've flown over 200 high altitude missions, testing systems and components. We haul every part of our airship up there and run the parts and components through their paces. On the ground side, our human integration testing is coming on strong with actual flight hardware being put through its paces. We do this aboard our submarine, the Bellavia. The orbital airship has a crew after all. We've come a long ways. A lot of work on the Ascender H1 has been done, but there's still a lot of work to go. So I can't give you a completion date, but it has begun. This is the H1, but will there be an H2? Yep, we're still working out the aerodynamics of the tails and the exact width of the nose. And I know there'll be countless other things we discover along the way. When we pile up enough of them, again, we'll redo the models and show you the Ascender H2 variant. But once it's done, what would you do with the orbital ascender? What exactly is it for? It's for low cost bulk cargo to and from orbit. That is the mission. We've also been thinking about a very specific mission that we would really like to do. After it's completed its mission, taken all the amazing images of the universe it can, we would use the orbital ascender to retrieve the Hubble Space Telescope, one of humanity's true great achievements, and bring it back to Earth so it could be seen in a place of honor at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. This is what that would look like. Be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with the latest. Thank you for watching. JP Aerospace, America's other space program.